Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the plenary. I hope you're all fine. I actually thought that the cast will take a little longer, but it looks like everyone was in the same position and you decided really fast. So, which is a good sign because we're talking about unity now. We come to the plenary of transition where we're going to talk about a green economy and social union. So therefore, if to start, it would be cool to, for all of you to have a seat and to stop chatting and to get your focus on stage because it's an important time we are on soon. Let's have it a little more quiet and everyone who takes their seat, please. Yeah, talk to you, all of you. That's right. You all get an A plus here, you're all sitting. You're all doing very well, yes. <laughs> yeah. So we might start. We're going up to the, uh, a little bit longer, okay. I got that sign. So it needs to be a little more quiet, I think, when I get that sign. So who's talking, except for me? I see you, I hear you, I tell you. No, I'm not one of those persons, I'm actually a nice person. And I'm really happy to be here, and we're really good in time, and we just have like four more hours to go, and then you're all done with all this Congress, so you all did very really well. And we have uh, one last input for the next one and a half hours. And the people are all waiting in line to come on stage, so therefore, I think I might start now. So welcome to the plenary towards a green economy and social union, because I think we all agree that the EU has to go towards a green economy and a social union, and we're talking about it, and we have special guests to come on stage. So I might introduce you to our wonderful moderation, which is Judith Puringer. She's co-leader of the Green Party in Vienna and city councillor and member of the state government Vienna in Austria. Welcome on stage. <laughs> nice to have you. And she will take over and I just go through the speakers uh, of the panel before you will introduce them a little longer. So we have Johannes uh, Rauch here, Federal Minister for Social Affairs, Health, Care and Consumer Protection from Austria. Please give it up for him. <laughs> you all know her already, but she's still here. Manali Vogel, co-chair of the European pa Green Party. <laughs> <laughs> we also have uh, Kadi Kenk uh, from Circularity Project, Societal Change Management Expert, responsible for Business Forum from Estonia. Nice to have you. <laughs> and last but not least, I hope I pronounced it right, it's Ernest Urtasson. Yes, I got it right. Member of the European Parliament, nice to have you. <laughs> and I wish you a successful panel and yeah, good luck. So thank you for this uh, beautiful moderation and I'm very happy and glad to be your host and moderator for this afternoon. I just uh, said to my podium that it's uh, very nice to come into this room. I had today a future congress of the 9th district of Vienna and it was very motivating, very inspiring to talk to Greens and also to locals on a district level about the future of Vienna, about the future of the district. And it's very nice to come here to see all these beautiful faces of green people fighting for a just Europe, for a social Europe. And it was very nice to uh, come in here and to feel this beautiful atmosphere. And I'm very happy to um, be the facilitator of this panel today. My name is Judith Püringer. I'm the co-leader of the Vienna Greens. And I'm uh, yeah, very grateful to host this panel today. We have one and a half hours, which is a lot and not a lot. Um, but uh, I'm sure we'll have a very uh, good discussion, a strong discussion, and you are also invited uh, to uh, put questions to the people on the panel. So our panel is on just transition and towards a green economy 
and a social union. So in the next one and a half hours, we will discuss one of the most pressing issues of our time, because in order to overcome um, climate change, environmental challenges, the European Union must transition towards a climate neutral economy on the one hand, and we hopefully all agree that this has to happen in a way that is fair, that is just, and that is socially inclusive for everyone concerned, so for the employers, for the employees, and for all citizens in Europe. So we have many opportunities on the one hand, but we have also many challenges that lie ahead of us, and we still have to find many political solutions for this just transition process. So there are still many questions open about where we start, about where we are going, where we are heading, and what our political agenda must be in order to really um, achieve uh, a just transition for everybody. So a lot to discuss in the next one and a half hours, and I'm very thrilled that we will have time to look at various aspects on, on just transition with the great panelists, and I'm very happy to introduce them to you, and I will start with Melanie Fougel. So Mel Melanie Fougel is the co-chair of the European Green Party since June 2022. She's one of the youngest senators in France. Um, yeah, old, old. <laughs> Do you mean it's easy to be the youngest? Still, you're the youngest, so congratulations on this. Yes. And um, she sits in the Committee for Social Affairs also. Prior to her uh, Senate mandate, she has been working as an advisor for the Green Group in the European Parliament uh, in the Committee of Constitutional Affairs, and she is an expert in European democracy and also feminism and LGBTIQ plus rights. Very warm welcome, Melanie. Yes, to my left is Johannes Rauch. Johannes Rauch, he is the Federal Minister of Social Affairs, Healthcare and Consumer Protection in Austria. He began his political career at the Austrian Green Party almost 40 years ago. He was starting in a local town council and Johannes led the Green Party's parliamentary group in the provincial parliament of Vorarlberg as a chairperson for over 10 years. Johannes is a former social worker and he relates very closely in his daily work, and I'm very proud to say this, very closely to people's everyday struggles, struggles in everyday life, and he really prioritizes social justice, affordable houses, housing, and accessible healthcare for all in his everyday political decision. There's a beautiful saying of Johannes, I quote very often, and this saying is that social work is political work and vice versa, political work is also social work. A very warm welcome to you, Johannes. <laughs> On the left is Ernest Urtesun. Yeah, they are all on my left, very good. Uh, he is an economist and a diplomat, and since 2014, he is member of the European Parliament, and he is vice president of the Greens and the European Free Alliance. He's coordinator of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. Ernest is from Barcelona, and from a very young age, he was already active politically with the young Green Left and the European Green Party. He had a leading role in the writing of the Green Position paper on Just Transition, and I can only tell you, please read this beautiful paper if you haven't read it, the paper on a transition that works for all the people, Ernest will talk about this, and it's very nice and beautiful to have you here on our panel today. Thank you, Ernest. <laughs> Last but not least, Kadi Kenk. Kadi Kenk, and it's really very nice, he, she is in the business of asking complicated questions to inspire the making of difficult political decisions. So <laughs> she's a societal change management expert. She's a trainer and a consultant for companies and governments alike. And in her advocacy work, she is mainly active in the EU packaging regulation and the global 
Plastics Treaty. Kadi is board member of Ecopreneur. So Ecopreneur is the European Sustainable Business Federation with member organizations of uh, seven European countries, including the Responsible Business Forum Estonia and also Austria's Grüne Wirtschaft. Very warm welcome to you, Kadi. We will, we will start. Um, Ernest, you worked on this uh, green vision for a just transition. If you worked on this paper, you have written this paper. And my question is, how does this vision, how does this vision of a just transition actually look like? So what are the main challenges and also the main um, opportunities to achieve this vision of a just transition? Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, also to say that, well, the, the, the creation, the drafting of this paper is really a collective work of our wonderful advisors in the European Parliament, but also different colleagues. I mean, we have Moni and Tom here, but also Tilly and uh, Kira, Wen, uh, all the MEPs that are here with us that uh, helped uh, drafting this paper. Uh, and, um, well, uh, since the beginning of the mandate, we wanted to do that because we have the impression uh, that the Green Deal, we have the impression that the Green Deal on its own uh, will not be successful without the strong social uh, dimension. Why is that so? Because it is impossible to move ahead with all the uh, uh, transformative uh, policies that we need to do in all the different fields, energy transport, without engaging everybody, without having the, super, uh, the sufficient democratic backing for it. And for that, you need really to work uh, on a Green Deal that is also social. So that is why we talk about the need to complement the Green Deal with a truly social deal. And also politically, because we uh, cannot forget that we uh, just uh, come from the still very difficult consequences of the last financial crisis, which left uh, ex uh, very strong bounds, bounds in our society uh, with a lo lots of inequality. So we are building the Green Deal on the basis of uh, an old European social contract that has been broken in several member states in the past. So we need to be aware that if we want the Green Deal to be successful, this needs to be also be fixed. So that is a bit the diagnosis that we made. And that is why we think that this uh, uh, this idea of the transition is uh, absolutely fundamental. So what are the dimensions? Because I, do, I don't want to take, uh, to take very long, or you can, you can read the paper. But one thing that for us is, uh, is very important, firstly, is that all the necessary transformation towards the green economy have a social component. What does it mean? It means that, we're, for instance, when we deploy renewables, we are sure that the local communities can profit from the employment that is created. When we need to uh, uh, move uh, and shift certain activities to other activities, that there is sufficient funding for reskilling and, uh, and, uh, and securing uh, jobs for people that will not be able to work in sectors that we know we'll need to phase out. So all this idea that the transition in key sectors need to, has, need to be accompanied with social policies and labor policies, not to leave everybody behind, I think. This is one particular uh, side of the story that is very important. For that, the European Union has put in place some policies. We have the just transition mechanisms and others, but we, in the European Parliament, we believe it's still insufficient. We need much more engagement with that. So this is uh, uh, one, one, uh, one question. The second question, which we cannot forget, is that we absolutely need uh, to create better wealth distribution at EU level to reinforce our social system. So all this, and the first dimension I, 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 I refer to, can only be done if we uh, move to better wealth distribution. And that means, and this is a very important part of the paper that you have in your hands, fixing taxation at the EU. So that, that, that is really a key component. So we cannot move uh, ahead with the Green Deal if we don't fix, if we don't make. And this has different dimension. One dimension is ending the subsidies to the big polluters and making the big polluters pay. This is the more evident. But then we have the whole question of what happens to corporate taxation, to the competition that happens within the EU with corporate taxation, with tax havens. I mean, we really need to work on the, the inside of our welfare state. And for us, this is also a, an extremely important, uh, important component. Um, thirdly, it's the question uh, of the decent jobs. And here I think it's very important also, I will refer to that maybe later in the debate, but it's important to understand as well that uh, in the last years we have o uh, under, undergone a process in several member states of uh, enlarging precarity. So our growth models have been based in, in two issues. One is the, is the 
the full growth model and the second one is the, uh, the job precarity growth model. So both things together has the final growth in the last years and both thi things need to be fixed. We need to phase out from, co from fossil fuels and we need to phase out from, pre from precarious jobs as a source of, uh, of uh, so-called growth. And for that, it means reverting completely the, the labor policies that we have done in the past, reinforce social bargaining, uh, increase a minimum wage, uh, engage with the unions again, because in my country, for instance, I can tell you in the past, we have had policies directly attacking the collective organization of workers, which has been very, very difficult. So I think this issue of decent jobs, and also with another dimension, which is, which is very important, which is tackling the new forms of precariousness that we have in our societies. And for instance, at EU level, we are working now in the directive on platform work. Platform work has become a new form of exploitation for several of our citizens in the EU. So these new forms of exploitation, they need to be fixed. So I think this, I this issue of the decent jobs is very important. And last but not least, I will end it here not to make very long. Uh, uh, very long. I think there's, when we talk about just transition, we cannot forget what the global component of what a just transition means. And that means that also in the past, our growth models have been based uh, 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 from the exploitation of natural resources from, the, from outside the EU. And now we also need to see, because now we are talking, for instance, about acce uh, accessing raw materials that are critical for the future economy. What does it mean, acce accessing raw materials for, uh, and critical materials from outside the EU for our economy? How does that relate to a, a global just transition? I think that component is also that this, this, this relies, of course, with the responsibilities of the EU at global level, but this component is also very important. So voila, those are some of the main elements, but uh, I'm very happy that we managed to do that, uh, that document, and I hope you will read it and you will find it interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. <laughs> Thank you for these uh, uh, main topics we have to address when we really want to talk about the just transition. Thank you also for putting the global perspective uh, into place here, I think this is very important. Coming to a national perspective, Johannes, um, in Austria the Greens are in a quite challenging uh, coalition uh, with the Conservative Party, and maybe you can tell us some, um, yeah, some experiences uh, of being in this coalition and also tell us about many successes the Green Party in Austria could achieve especially when it comes to the questions of precariousness, the questions of decent jobs, but also the questions of um, uh, people um, who are in poverty or facing uh, social exclusion. Well, to be in a coalition with the Conservative Party, it's a kind of special adventure, <laughs> day by day. And uh, maybe you ask, uh, how, is, how is it possible to do um, a thing like um, just transition with the Conservative Party? Is it possible? In parts. In parts it is. But it's a, it's a very tough, and it's, an, and it's a struggle, a daily struggle, you know. So what, it, what we have tried to do, we have uh, succeeded in pushing through an eco-social tax reform and uh, we are able to launch the largest tax relief package of the past decades. Um, so we can say mm, carbon pricing is now just uh, on the agenda. It's a very important step, I guess, uh, on Austria's path to, towards climate neutrality in 2040. The government has agreed that starting this autumn, climate dam damaging CO2 emissions will cost 30 euros per ton. Now you can say, why only 30 euros? So it would better, better be 100 or so. Yeah, but on the other hand, zero will be worse. So this 30 uh, euros per ton is the starting uh, point, and the prices will increase annually uh, to 55 uh, euros per ton in 2025. And for the first time, uh, a tangible climate protection um, tool has been integrated to our tax system 
first. And I can proudly say that this uh, signals a paradigm shift in Austria. And on the other hand, uh, on the social side, uh, it's also a really challenge with the Conservative Party because uh, they are in the moon. Everybody is, it's, is, uh, it has to do this for its own. And uh, if you are working, you have all the chances in Austria and all that stuff. And if you are uh, out of the labor market, uh, it's your problem, not ours. So, uh, social policy is closest to my heart. And I started one year, about a one year ago, as a, a, a minister for health because the pandemic is uh, just uh, actual in these days. And then I removed, I moved to the social uh, minister because it's very important. And I, I feel if we aren't able to get an answer to the poverty of uh, population, and we, if we aren't able to answer inflation, upcoming inflation in Austria, uh, the inflation rate is up to 10% over a month. Uh, and if we aren't able to give answers, um, people are losing uh, their jobs or losing their income, we will lose them. And we just wouldn't lose them for um, for, <laughs> for our party or for elections. We are losing them as as members of the society, and that will that will become a, a democratic problem because the upcoming far right in Austria, and you have to know the Austrian far right party FPÖ uh, is running for the first place. They are actually in, in the up to thirty percent. Uh, and they have to, to, to give an answer from the left side, I guess. And so if we aren't able to, as Greens in a government, to give social answers, and we try to do that, we spent a lot of money uh, for, for, for the, for the um, pensionists, for people uh, in the healthcare system, uh, we have taken action on energy prices, energy poverty, housing costs, and food prices, uh, and we spent uh, billions of euros. Um, so we try very hard to give people the impression there is one minister in the whole government, n the Minister for Social uh, Affairs, who is fighting for us. And they have to get a feeling there is one guy who is fighting for us, and they try to do that. I can only say that is the, is the microphone. Ah, yeah, no. I can only say that um, this is the impression many uh, people and and especially l social organizations, the civil society definitely has. And I think uh, the example of the taxation, uh, the social ecological taxation, as you just mentioned, it it was r really a, a shift in paradigm. We didn't have a tax like this before, so it really. Um, is part of uh, speaking about distribution, about just uh, distribution, and, and it will be something that will stay. So this is uh, like a, it was a in my in my point of view a very important measure. Yes, we were criticized because it wasn't high enough, but it was like a paradigm shift to actually talk about a new distribution of uh, taxes in Austria. Melanie, from the national level in Austria, back to the European level. So from your is. Uh, from your perspective, where does the political or the institutional structure need to be adapted in order to really uh, ensure that the just transition can take place and will work out for all people, all citizens in Europe? Yes, um, thank you for the question. I will answer it, but uh, I think with my answer, I will answer another question that you didn't ask, because I think this question, what needs to be changed in the institutional structure of the EU in order to make more social policies, it is a good question. We know that we need to reform certain rules at EU level to make it easier, um, quicker, faster and more efficient to have social policies. For example, everybody knows in this room at least that uh, we need to have more competences on social issues at the European level. Uh, it is not normal that we have more competencies to regulate the internal market. 
uh, than to regulate. Um, and we also know that we have to change our um, decision-making processes because in some questions related to social we have unanimity and that's a problem because everybody knows, we say it all the time, unanimity sucks. Um, so that's clear. Still, I don't think that, um, at least in the campaign, we should give this easy argument to the people who politically don't want to have better social policies to say, okay, you know, we cannot really do social policies at EU level because, you know, we don't have the competence, we don't have the budget, we have unanimity, so sorry, it's not our fault. Because I think it's not true. What happened after the COVID crisis showed that when there is political will, we can do it. Of course, we need, and I mean, if when we get into power and we have the absolute majority, we will change the treaty, we will end unanimity, we will have more competences, yeah. But uh, until we get there, we can still do a lot of things if political will is there. And I think we have to make clear that most of the time when it's not done, it's because of a lack of political will to do so, and it's because of a national way of seeing the issues. Now, so thank you for uh, for stressing this again and putting it so 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 very good uh, to the point. Um, you were talking about political will, and I'm coming to you, Cardi, because you are you work closely with governments, you work uh, closely also with businesses and the economy in the European Union. Um, how can we convince governments, and how can we also? convince businesses to be part of the just transition, uh, to contribute to, to a just transition. So um, what is your way of, uh, of uh, talking to political leaders, of talking to governments, of talking to the European Union in order to convince them? <coughs> wow, uh, quite a lot of questions all at once. Earlier when I came in, I found it was hard uh, for um, the audience to settle down to allow us to come here on the stage. But I think there's a very good reason for this. It's because you have a lot to say and a lot of thoughts yourself. So um, I'm wondering if you think of this question that was asked from me right now, would you have an answer for this? in one word or, or a phrase, do you think you'd have an answer for this? Who'd raise their hand and say, I'd be up for answering it? <laughs> not in one sentence and maybe not even, in, you know, our, even one word or even not even in one hour that is left for, uh, for us to, uh, to discuss here on the stage. But I'd say if I'd had an answer for this, I'd be a god. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense that I, I'd have this answer. When was the last time that you were asked uh, a, a difficult question or brought a new idea and then everybody accepted this all at once? No convincing needed. What we do know where we're seeing this is, I, I suppose an example we bring also something, a topic on our table today is when a far right conservative party comes to offer a really simple solution to a very complex problem. We like that, don't we? Or people like that. So uh, the, the, reality, the answer to this question is that uh, don't make this problem of how to convince your own because it's not our problem, it's everybody's problem, the planet, the humanity's problem. So if you say, I have a solution to our problem and you fail at uh, delivering your, uh, your solution, then it's, it was your fail. So it's really about how do you engage with people of explaining uh, that we have this problem, but at least show the backbone of saying, I'm up for the challenge and you can feel safe when you are with me on this journey to try to find the best possible answers. So I suppose that would be, that would be my answer because we don't talk to people enough. We are afraid of the various answers we receive and the time it takes to, dis to talk to everybody, but it's really the most important part. You want to be asked, what do you think, right? Or, <laughs> <laughs> right? I think it's, it, it's a, we're still in a political agenda, it's, it's a democratic place here, right? So, 
so you like to be asked, so we, it is really about the asking and it might take longer for us to answer because we have so many ideas, but we'll never be doing them alone. We're just asked here, we have the honor of representing a community really here. It's not in our brains here on the stage, it's really, I represent EU Sustainable Business Union, but we have six countries on board, six countries where you have businesses who are uh, brave enough to claim that they are sustainable businesses. So I urge you to think well and, and seek up from Ecopreneur's page, is your country one of them? And if not, do you, and if not, do you, do you have uh, businesses that are willing to think sustainably and where are they? Are they alone or do they unite? And if they do, then they should be with us. We should be together on this because the voice of the entrepreneurs, especially when we're talking about the real transition and the justice behind this is when we're talking about small and medium sized enterprises and um, their voice won't make it to the decision makers alone. They wouldn't even know how to do this. So that's what, what we're there for. To, to help them have that confidence that we're really on this path. It's not easy, but we're, you know, brave enough to, to be on this journey and represent them. Thank you very much, Kadi. <laughs> and I think you opened up uh, with your statement a very important issue. It's the issue of how do we, how can we actually succeed in our uh, uh, making people participate and uh, making people uh, engaged in, in this agenda, in this political agenda. It's a very tricky question. And you also just mentioned the rise of right-wing parties. So it's the situation everywhere in Europe. It's, it's the situation in Austria. It's a very um, scary situation, um, this rise in uh, right-wing parties who either deny uh, the existence of climate crisis or are downplaying its dimensions and its effects. And at the same time, we are also experiencing an increase uh, of, uh, of the loss of trust. So people don't trust in politics anymore. People also don't trust science anymore, as we've seen through the pandemic. So we are in a really uh, very challenging situation at the moment. And simultaneously, as you just said, uh, engaging people, uh, making people participate is something like uh, um, a key, a key for the implementation of a just transition agenda in the European Union. So um, I think this is one of the most important questions, how we actively involve as many people as possible and like all the people in all variety and diversity in this process. So Melanie. One question to you, so how, how, from your point of view, from your perspective, also from your experience, how can we guarantee that marginalized people, uh, that people uh, who are vulnerable groups are actually motivated uh, to stay on board and that uh, they are actually um, uh, active participants in this, in this whole process? How can, we, how can we guarantee this? Or do you have any, any best practice examples of how it could actually work? Mm. Thanks for the question, it's, it's not an easy one and I think um, with humility that if we had the perfect question to, to, the, to uh, the perfect answer to this question, we, we wouldn't be um, where we are now. Um, still, I think um, when it comes to involving people, um, I would say I, I see three, uh, four things. Yeah. The first one is of course that, and Ernest said it at the beginning, um, we have to strengthen really social bargaining. Um, I, I come from France and we are in a, in a moment in France where all trade unions were completely ignored during a political discussion that was really hard about a reform that nobody wanted and we are in a situation where whatever you think about the reform, that's not the, that's not the topic, but you have a situation where 100% 100% of trade unions in a big country like France disagree with something and you still go on. And this is something that is really, really hard. And it actually gave uh, incentive to a lot of people when they saw that the big marches were organized by trade unions to actually join a trade union. 
And now they are becoming more powerful than what they were before. We also have an issue uh, in France with this. It also comes from the system we have. If you don't give a, a space, like a power to unions, then people don't really join them because they don't see the added value. Um, and now we have some, I'm not going to give examples because, I mean, whatever, but we have some wins uh, currently from local groups of trade unions because people rediscover the need to join unions. And I think that's very important. It's also very important to find ways to involve um, workers who are working in sectors where by definition it's difficult to to be in unions like platform workers who are one of the most marginalized uh, workers group. Um, we have fought for this a lot at European level and this is to me really key because that's where the new precarity is, is clearly going. Um, the other thing is that in the, the kind of demands, measures we are calling for in our campaigns, I think we need to campaign on new rights, new eco-social rights that are very concrete for people. Because very often we, we talk at meta level, and it's also very important, right? But we talk about the transition, millions of jobs that are going to disappear in this sector, they will move there, na na na. But for individuals, this is not always very easy to grasp. And the main question they have is, yes, but do, am I still going myself to have a job? And we know that it's not overnight that people are going to move from this region to this region to do that. So we have to campaign on very concrete new rights. Uh, for example, I don't know, when you work in a sector that is going to disappear, uh, that you would get I don't know how many years of free training to reskill, things like that, that are really concrete for people in their daily life and they can see that they will be safer with you. And the last thing, and I think it's something that we all should reflect on, is about ourselves. We are asking this question to ourselves also because we, a lot of people who are in these marginalized, vulnerable groups, they're not necessarily in this room. And that's a problem. And we need to reflect on that to proactively change also our green family to be more diverse ourselves. Because when you are more diverse yourself, what you say, the messaging, uh, is also then more diverse and more attractive to more people because people are there with you, they are talking. Um, and yeah, I think this is something we still have a lot of work to do. We are all really willing to do it. And I hope we will improve again and again. Round of applause. So campaigning on social uh, rights, campaigning on more diversity within the uh, green family. Uh, do you have any uh, additions on this, Ernest? Like uh, additions on how can we actually achieve more participation and especially more participation of uh, people who maybe um, have no trust in politics anymore, have no trust in science anymore and who turn away maybe also from the, from the European project? Well, I think in the, um, in the last years in many m countries what, what has happened is that we, uh, our policies have not been able to provide uh, sufficient means for this thing living to too many people. And that completely uh, uh, blocks you out of politics. Huh? If, if, you, if you're not part of a system any longer and the system does not provide you a decent life, you automatically are pulled out of the democratic system. I think that we need to be aware that why our democracies in the second half of the 20th century were so strong. I think our democracies were so strong because we managed to build probably one of the most successful projects that the Europeans have built in their history, which is their welfare state. The, welfare sta the European welfare state is one of the most successful projects that we Europeans have built in our history. Why our democracies are now sick, in my opinion, is that because the welfare state is not functioning any longer. And, and this is what needs to be fixed, in my opinion. So there's no democracy without a strong social welfare. For that, this is very fundamental, but for me it's very clear. And just to go back maybe to the issue of wages, which for me has defined a lot why so many people have been excluded, uh, uh, have been excluded from society. Let me take the, the case of Spain. No? What, what has happened ex in Spain? A very, very radical experiment. No? In, two, in, two, in 2011, 
uh, they, the conservative government uh, told us that after the financial crisis, the only way of being competitive in the world was to massively devaluate our jobs and our salaries. Mm -hmm. And that was a systematic policy of devaluation of wages, salaries, and, and, and job conditions. And that was being told to the Spanish society, this is the only way we will be competitive, the only way our economy will survive. So what they did, very radical uh, uh, labor market reform, easier uh, dismissals, very cheap dismissals, a massive, massive uh, uh, usage of temporary jobs, which means for young people, you're hired, you were hired six months, you were dismissed, not ho you didn't have holidays, you were dismissed, and then after August, you were uh, rehired for another six months. So this is how the, the Spanish labor market worked, and they completely contained the minimum wage. So minimum wage was stagnated at 600 euros for a decade. Did this make the, eco the Spanish economy more successful? No, it did not. We did, we did not perform better uh, with, uh, with our exports. We did not perform better. Uh, our economy did not perform better. And we uh, started to create a huge democratic problem because people started to feel that uh, politicians did not take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is, this is the story of a big failure. And now I take what happens in the last year with the change of government in Spain where there was a radical change of the labor policies. So with the labor reform we just adopted that you probably know by, by Vice President Yolanda Diaz, we have raised minimum wage by 40%. We are now above 1,000 euros. For Spain is a lot. I know for Austria not, but for Spain is a huge increase. And there's a, a, a labor reform which basically makes that permanent jobs are mandatory with very limited uh, uh, circumstances that you need to justify why a temporary job, why a job uh, contract is temporary. Which then you provide people with, with a, a certain stability and perspective on their lives. And when you provide stability and perspective to someone's lives, you create a citizen that is engaged politically, and then you also create somebody who can learn, who can educate better themselves, and then you have a, a, a more skilled workforce. Result of these policies, we are at record exports in Spain at the moment, and the economy is performing better than ever. So the lie that neoliberals told us in the last years that we needed to devaluate jobs and to make uh, jobs more precarious to make our economies competitive was a lie. It's not the case. The other, the other, the other policies work, and I think this is how you really re-engage citizens towards such a project like the transition, which is a very, very difficult. But then and work in fear. This is very fundamental. And the second thing. I think we need to have specific f programs for specific sectors on reskilling, on accompanying the transition, and that. And but for that, what is very important, I, I want to go back to that point: cooperation with strong unions. For me, this is very important. The unions have a very important role to play in, in that. If we really have uh, the governments aligned with the unions in order to make those workers transit or, or through education to reskilling sectors, it the work, but our policy in several member states in the last year has been systematically to weaken the unions. We, uh, in France, Macron is unions, Spain in the in previous governments has tried to weaken the unions, and that is fundamentally wrong. So th 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 that is what I would say, I think, having a, a net that works for everybody, uh, that allows people not to work in fear, and secondly, to accompany sectors that will be affected with concrete policies in cooperation with the unions. I mean, this is more complex than that, but I think th th those are two dimensions that I think are very important. Melanie. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I think the example of Horas, uh, that if you ask a person, what do you prefer between keeping your job, even though you know it's going to be bad after a while or a just transition. The person answers, I prefer to keep my job. Um, I think it just shows why we need states, parliament, democracy to make policies because then policies drive the reality. Uh, if you just let it to individual decisions, well, we know that, okay, it's not going to work. So that's also why we're here to design policies. Um, still, how do you convince um, how do you make this um, a positive perspective for people? First thing that I wanted to say is exactly what Ernest said. Uh, you need to have concrete solutions that people believe in are going to work uh, if they are negatively affected. And for example, the fact that you will get a good unemployment scheme when you are part of certain sectors, these things are key. The other thing that I wanted to say, um, in the, in the French Senate, we, I worked on um, a report on green social security. 
So it's an uh, opposition right to build special committees or inquiry committee on topics. The other groups, they cannot say yes or no, they just have to accept. So when it was the turn of the Greens, we say we want to work on the green social security. And then the other groups were like, okay, but what the fuck is this? Uh, we cannot send any member to your committee because we don't understand the topic. What is this? Um, and actually, um, so the, the idea was to say, okay, we have a social protection system, how to make it resilient to climate change, and how, because of course the risk that our social protection system was designed to cover were different from the risk that is in the society because of climate change, which is a much bigger risk. And then our social security system cannot, cannot do it. Um, and also the way it's financed and the way it's organized. Um, and we came up to different, uh, and then they understood the problem. Um, and then we came up to different uh, solutions, working more on prevention, etc. But also uh, this idea that I think is also a source of trust that you can build in people if they see, okay, that's something, I, okay, that could impact my life, I could use it, and it could be positive. It was this idea of having that the social security could offer uh, universal allowance for healthy food. So we know that access to healthy food is one of the biggest determinants of social injustices and of public health, because if you're more vulnerable, you don't have access to to healthy food, and then you get more sick, and then, and, and the fact if, so there are different models for this, but this is the thing if you tell people, okay, our social model is going to give you the right to have access to healthy food. We, there are different solutions with social security cards, you can buy food in organic shops, there are different models. But then with a tool like this, first of all, you offer a new right, something that is positive, um, that people are going to use, and also you accelerate the transition. Because then, I mean, we calculated this, you can read the report, it's 300 pages if you have nothing to do, but um, you accelerate the agriculture transition because then you offer uh, uh, possibilities for farmers to sell their goods, etc. And it's a virtuous tool mm. based on the principle of social security that is actually helping the green transition without telling people we are doing this for the green transition. Giving them something that is good for them and it's, they are not going to use it for the transition, they are going to use them for themselves and then it's going to have a positive impact on the economy. Thank you, thank you for this example on green social security. I think it's very interesting also the way you describe how to um, have a virtuous circle instead of a vicious circle. Uh, I think it's a very beautiful Example. There's one more question in the first, but first, um, Johannes also wants to talk about this question of social yeah, security ju and Just the a labor few market. words on another topic on the labor market, because we have a problem, I guess, not, all, not almost in Austria or uh, in all member states. Uh, as we all know, we live in an aging society, and uh, in, in Austria alone, we will need about 80,000 additional workers in the care system, in the care sector by 2030, 80,000 plus. And we aren't able to get them in the, on the labor market in Austria. It's completely impossible. So we definitely need immigration. That's the point. And the last 15 years, the Austrian policy, especially from the conservatives and the far right parties, uh, was, the message was everything that comes from outside is evil and threatening and dangerous. And that's completely stupid. That's completely stupid. We have, it's, it's absurd. Uh, it's damaging us as a society. So we have to change uh, our, our, uh, our words. We have to say, you're welcome here. Um, we give you good working conditions. We need you. Uh, and we, if we aren't able as European Union, as the member states of the European Union, to do uh, a good and fair immigration policy, we lose. We aren't 
able uh, to do our labor market uh, challenges in the future, in the next 10, 10 to 20 years, especially in the care and the health system. Thank you for this addition, Johannes. And um, I think there is another question in the first row. Okay, that's better. <laughs> Um, my name is Catherine. I'm from Eng uh, Green Party of England and Wales. Um, I just want to thank you for supporting a very strong statement on the UK's illegal immigration bill. So my question is directly related to that. Um, and to Melanie, your point about there is a there's different versions of Planet A that we could create, and one of those versions is a Europe that is a fortress that says we have a safety net. We are okay. You are, you know, we we create solutions for ourselves. I'm glad you just brought up migration, so, but it's not just about our labor markets. How do we create a system where the social net is resilient and able to cope with people who are not just coming to work, but people who need asylum, who need refuge from the particularly the changes that are being brought on climate across the world? And so how do we, how do we create societies that accept that or trust that the social net is strong enough and wide enough to bring those people in. Thank you. Melanie, maybe? Uh, I, Melanie, okay, maybe? Wait. Okay, Kari wants to I, I, I think I'll just give a short, in first place that how is a complicated question. Sure, we can start developing this, but yes, the more important part is saying we agree that yes, we are going to provide that. We need to do this, it's necessary. Uh, because from private sector side, you'd look at the economic sector and the economists and analysis, analysis who would say the green transition is basically a violation of human rights because look what you're doing to these people. You're going to be putting them out of jobs. You're going to make it really expensive for them to live or, or survive or you're taking away their lousy jobs that we're enabling with our lousy consumption behavior, right? Uh, of saying, you know, it's not perfect, but at least it's there. And uh, this way, neglecting completely that the government does have a role in making sure that when we have a transition and some people are being left behind, they are taken care of. This is something companies have never done and they will never do voluntarily. Or let's say some do, you know, our members do, but not all, and you can't uh, um, imagine that this is how they establish themselves. So it's like, first the question is making sure, yes, that is what we want to achieve. We want to make sure that this net is there, but then how, um, that this is something maybe other panelists want to touch upon. Yeah, thanks for the, yeah, for the question. So basically on the, the link between migration policy and, and social justice and how can we sure that our social system integrate rightly and fairly uh, migrants. I think the blockage of this is not in our social systems. There is a problem with migrants when it comes to our social systems. This is something that is pure. The problem in this debate doesn't come from a technical solution to implement in our social system. Our social system actually benefiting from migrants. Um, the problem we have, I think, is, it's a completely different one, is the space we give to the far right in the public debate. That's the problem we have, and we have it all around Europe. And then we give the space in public media to people who are going to explain you that all the problems in your life and all the social insecurity you have, it doesn't come from the wrong decision that we are doing, it comes from the migrants. And it's just a lie. And it's just if you give more and more space to these ideas, it works. But actually, the policies we are building when it comes to migration and social policies, they are, like, they are irrational. We are benefiting, and it, it's not even the reason why we should be in favor of giving migrants fundamental rights, and we should do this anyway, whether it would be beneficial or not for the economy. But it's just a fact that we are losing public money because we don't give 
proper workers' rights to migrants. It's an irrational position just for populistic reasons. And the calculation we have, at least in France, is massive. Like what we would gain in terms of public money if just migrants and the So I'm going to... <laughs> I'm okay. going to end here. Yeah, yes, it will come again. And uh, we have another question here in the sixth row in the middle. Yes. Tatika Barbuza from uh, Green Party Romania. Uh, we speak here about um, green transition and rescue, but I think we, we need to not forget that uh, Hashar people and company uh, see the person over 40, 45 years at like uh, undesirable to um, give jobs, even they are retiring, and especially if the, they are new in the job. So it's a problem in Romania, in Romania and must be a problem everywhere, and this problem must be addressed. How we train Hasha people and managers to not see people in mid ages, like not good to be employed. And the second, um, the examples of public public policy here are very important, but to um, manage of fears uh, of people, how to how 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 we will um, look the transition for him, we need models that can be seen how the people in other countries or in other regions made this transition and was uh, beneficially. Maybe uh, television, green television with movies will, <laughs> will serve uh, to lower the fears. Thank you very much for this contribution and I'm very happy that you bring in the Romanian perspective here. And I just wanted to remind you, like two days ago, we had uh, the CERT uh, round here in Vienna, so the Central European Round Table. Um, and I'm very happy that Monivana is here, who is the founder of CERT uh, and, and <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> and because of Monivana's initiative, we um, succeeded in like every year hosting this Central European Round Table for the Greens. And uh, it was so impressive for me to take part in this CERT uh, and also to put this social agenda and the question of the social union that, that is now so uh, in, the, in the middle of our discussion. And that's what I really like that we are talking about green transition and uh, we land at these basic questions of social security. And I think uh, that is very beautiful. But back to your I understood it right. Your question is in order to um, also go with us uh, within this uh, green transition, um, how we uh, employ also vulnerable, vulnerable people and how uh, we bring employers to actually take the fears of the employees also, maybe Cardi or maybe Ernest. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer from the company side. Oh, our employers need so much educating in so many dish issues when it's in green transition. This question was related to green, green transition, but in general, social, really, um, because our employers don't know what kind of skills they need. They don't even know that they lack them. Uh, and this is because the way how business has been done is been learned by businesses that already operate, by the way how we teach business in school, etc the kind of new programs on what a sustainable business is, 
is only to come. It's not there yet. And uh, it's only, you know, step by step, we, we have these initiatives with, uh, you know, mini nano degrees in universities and something where you have ESG leaders and, you know, it's, it's going, going there. But the values are, you know, they come from somewhere else. So it might be a long transition, but it's important to understand that the lack of knowledge of what you really miss uh, or what you need is um, it, it's out there anyways. The good part about the, you know, having to understand what you, what's your impact to workforce comes with the corporate sustainable, um, sustainable <laughs> CSRD, sorry. Uh, co corporate social respons uh, responsibility standards and directive, at least major and large companies have to start uh, measuring and um, managing the impact they have to their own labor force and publish it and make it so that government can also make you accountable for whether you're actually engaging, uh, supporting us in this transition, being able to engage the necessary workforce of making sure that the way how you do business also helps out the government in its own other endeavors. So it, it's, it's more like saying that we have one problem or two. We have many problems, let's just agree. There's many things to solve, but the question is going step by step, starting with those who want and then sharing the best practice. So that's one of the reasons why Ecopreneur uh, has been established and some one thing that we do that you can come in there and see hey it's actually possible to be green and profitable so and not only green but also socially just thank you we are nearly out of time and i see many more questions I and i really uh, i didn't look at you before Okay, so then I take one last question and you have to make your uh, closing uh, statement very, very short. So one last question here in the third row and then we come to our closing statements because we are nearly out of time already. Um, we were talking about just transition and green economy, um, but I was wondering how would that work for countries where we get our resources from, so for example, for solar panels or electrification of cars, electric batteries, we get our resources from countries, for example, in Africa, which then are destabilized. So I'm really happy we're talking about a just uh, transition, a social union, green economy, but for who is it just? Just for us here in Europe, or is it supposed to be just as well for them in other countries? And if so, how are we gonna get there? Because I don't see that yet. Um, so I was wondering what your answer would be on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for bringing this global perspective and this question of for who is it just? Who wants to answer this question? Ernest. No, I, I think this is a fundamental question. I, I mentioned briefly the issue among my, my, my introductory points. Because, uh, well, le le let's take mining, which is probably the issue you referred. There's a, a mining fever now because we need to access materials. Um, and one thing we firstly need to realize is that with this issue of the, uh, the accession of materials, we need to forget that we are going to build a green economy which will basically transform all kinds of activities that we now do into activities that will work with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, without emissions and with electricity. This will simply not work. Forget about having enough lithium to replace all the combustion engines for el with electric cars. It's simply impossible. Also because we, uh, otherwise we will need to engage in a, uh, in, a, in a global war for lithium access with other superpowers. I mean, this is crazy. It's crazy. It cannot be organized like that. Unfortunately, it is a bit, and that's why I mentioned the, uh, um, the Critical Raw Materials Act that the EU is debating at the moment. We need to be extremely careful with that. Because I think that uh, we cannot imagine a situation where the, uh, the, the most developed economies do their transition on the back of poor economies that will be providing the raw materials for this to happen. So yes, indeed, this uh, uh, transition that is globally just, I think this is key. And we as Greens, we need absolutely to fight for that. We cannot accept, for instance, that we are going to exploit completely the resources of third countries without... Uh, uh, for, for our own transition without taking our own share of responsibility. So I think this is a, a key element, absolutely. 
Okay, so we've nearly come to an end, uh, and I want to come back uh, to all of you with a closing statement um, of you as panelists. And maybe to make it really short and on point, I want to ask you if there was one single action or one single measure to push the green transition, the just transition agenda forward. Um, what would it be? What would you pick if you could decide tomorrow on this one measure? What would you choose? and maybe you wrap it up also in your final closing statement. And maybe we start with Johannes, and we go all the way along the podium. So I try to do it in one minute. In a, in a situation with upcoming far-right parties all over Europe, um, having a debate, uh, Europe is a failed project from the far-right parties. We have to fight for this European Union for, and for a better European Union. And there's no alternative, I say. So if we have the idea, the far right have the idea, we can, we can uh, solve the, the problems, the upcoming and the existing problems on a nationwide level. It's stupid. And we have to name that stupid. It's no way to do it on a nationwide level. So let's fight for a strong European Union, for a solidarity in European Union. Otherwise, we are losing everything, our freedom, our way of life, uh, and our way to life as a society we imagine that must be like a transition, just transition, solidarity. Thank you. Melanie. Of course, uh, one thing is, is difficult uh, to pick, but I would say, as we know that today the biggest threat to the green transition and to social justice and to keeping the EU, which means to keeping European democracy alive, is this convergence that we see more and more and more and more country and also at European level between the conservative, the liberals and the far right. And we have seen this uh, last week in Spain, where the, the really the campaign against our ideas was really the main thing of the campaign, going against all social measures and green measures that are actually necessary. So if there was one thing I could say, I could do, would be to win the Spanish election on the 23rd of July. And I'm asking you, <laughs> Because this is really about our common future. I'm asking you, if you can, to support with all your hearts our Spanish friends to win the elections. Because if they don't, I don't know where we're going to go together. So help the, fr the, the French as well, the Spanish, to win the elections. In short, uh, I make everyone accountable for their role, and that means a government uh, should be the one opening doors for companies that go for green transition, and on the other hand, uh, make sure that everyone left behind are in a good place. Uh, at the same time, both the companies and uh, policymakers being responsible for supporting and collaborating with a strong civil society, who is there always to be one step ahead of them, their best partner, but also critic, critic, and then making sure that the individuals inside the system are not held accountable for everything being left undone by the prior three that I mentioned. Thank you. Maybe just a uh, Melanie remind me be about this campaign that happened in France during the Civil War. Uh, it was a, a poster of Pablo Picasso, Edel Espagne. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, all help is needed, but I have something to tell you. I think we are going to win the election, Melanie, so don't worry too much about that. Um, so we'll bring another progressive government to the EU from Spain, I'm sure of that, and we'll, we're, we're, we're working hard to achieve that. On your question, uh, very I will try to be very concrete. Um, if I have to choose one thing, I would like to uh, end tax competition at the EU. Uh, we, because tax competition is harming every single member state to have the sufficient resources to fund its, uh, its welfare states. And in order to uh, end tax competition in the EU, we need to uh, end unanimity in decision making in the Council when it comes to taxation issues. 
it's very concrete, but I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you. A big last final applause for these wonderful and very wise panelists. And a big round of applause to you. You were such a concentrated and um, very uh, inspiring uh, audience. And you were so um, fully disciplined until the end. So thank you very much for listening. Sa thank you very much for engaging. And have a very good afternoon and a beautiful time in Vienna. Thank you. And a big and, and a big thank you to you as a moderator, you did Puringer as well. And we have uh, 20 minutes, yeah, 20 second minutes before we start with the election and the voting. So get your coffee and your uh, break ready. And for all of you who didn't do the voting, please find the table on your left side to the stage for the voting advisors because we're then doing the voting and the election.